When we encounter Jesus during this time of the year, we're talking about the encounters with Jesus. We hear about his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, his parables. We, we talk about his miracles, the, his healings, the raising of the dead, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, and so forth. Uh, but we also, when we go through the pages of the New Testament, we discover the events that took place in the ministry of Jesus. So we can talk about his baptism, transfiguration, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And of course, of all these events, I, I think the transfiguration is the one that receives the least emphasis. I've come to the conclusion, not just as a result of preparing the sermon, but in the past also, that the transfiguration should be given much greater emphasis uh, within the life of the church, because it means a great deal, especially when you put it into juxtaposition with the crucifixion. Uh, the transfiguration becomes a very, very important event. Um, this is the season of Epiphany. We've been in the season of Epiphany since the Sunday after Christmas. Uh, it begins with the coming of the wise men. Uh, the season of Epiphany is about Jesus, manifestations of Jesus. And every year uh, at the last Sunday in Epiphany, right before we enter into Ash Wednesday, uh, every year... Uh, the gospel lesson is the transfiguration. Uh, so if you're ever watching Jeopardy and it's uh, what is the gospel lesson on the last Sunday of Epiphany, you'll know it's always transfiguration. It is every single year. It's a very important juxtaposition with the beginning of Lent, that before we go to Mount Calvary, we go to Mount Tabor. Uh, we see the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus, and then we go through Lent and Holy Week uh, and the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. Uh, these two are very important, as, as I hope you will see this morning, uh, when we put these two events uh, side by side. Uh, after six days, uh, Matthew records, six days after what? Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, we have the great Caesarea Philippi confession of Peter, where Jesus asked, whom do men say that I am? And Jesus said, you are, and Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. And then Jesus went on in Matthew 16 and explained to them that they would be going to Jerusalem where he would be handed over to the chief priests, where he would be crucified and so forth. And Peter responded again, oh, Lord, don't, that'll never happen to you. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, six days after that event, now, of course, there were times when Jesus did tell his disciples that he was going to die, but I don't think it really ever sunk in until the event occurred. Now, six days after that Caesarea Philippi confession, uh, Jesus went with his disciples, Peter, James, and John, the inner circle. He took them up into a high mountain. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, we believe that that high mountain is Mount Tabor. Uh, it is uh, south of the Sea of Galilee, when we were in Israel, we stood on, on, on Mount Carmel. We could look across the Megiddo Valley, and there we could see Mount Tabor. Uh, the Bible said it's a high mountain, but it really is only about 1,900 feet high. But I guess if you're going up those 1,900 feet, it's a high mountain. Um, now, I, I put that picture there because you do see that uh, the clouds do occasionally uh, cover Mount Tabor, uh, as we read in, in the text. Now, some have suggested that the transfiguration happened actually on Mount Hermon, which is nearer to Caesarea Philippi, up in, way up in northern Galilee. Uh, but Mount Hermon is a very, very high mountain with snow at the top. There's always, there's, that's the ski area in Israel on the top of Mount Hermon. Uh, but traditionally, most people have said that this occurred on Mount Tabor uh, in, south of Galilee. Anyway, uh, and so Jesus took them up that very high mountain, uh, and there something happened. Uh, his countenance changed. His garments changed. They became bright as the sun. His, his face shone. Uh, there was a change in his countenance. Um, and then appearing with him were Moses and Elijah. I often wondered how they knew it was Moses and Elijah. They probably didn't have photographs, but somehow they knew this was Moses and this was Elijah who were standing there with Jesus, one on one side and the other on the other side. 
Now, Peter, of course, as the, the Greek word they use here is that he was kind of out of his mind. Uh, Peter jumps up, Lord, wow, whoa, it's good to be here. Uh, why don't we uh, make a few shelters here? We'll build some shelters and we'll just hang around up here. Uh, me, you, Moses, Elijah, it's good, Lord, to be here. Uh, Peter really didn't know what he was talking about. You know, I, sometimes I think that after the ascension, I'll bet these disciples, they had to get together as the years went by. They had to reminisce about being with Jesus and the things that occurred. And you, could, you could hear maybe James and John saying, Peter, boy, that was a dumb thing you said up there. Remember that? And of course, Peter probably said, yeah, I had no idea what I was talking about. And Peter was divinely interrupted. A cloud covered the mountain. And out of the cloud came this voice. You are my son. I love you. I am pleased with you. Listen to him. Uh, it is interesting that, you know, in the very beginning of Epiphany, we deal with the baptism. At the end of Epiphany, we deal with the transfiguration. These are the bookmarks of the Epiphany season. And in both those events being the baptism, where we hear the voice from heaven, and the transfiguration, we hear the voice from heaven. And these are the bookends of the season of Epiphany. Uh, and so this event occurs, a, an incredible event. Now, I found it very interesting, as I thought about it this week, that here you have Peter um, in his second epistle. We, we read the text. Uh, he is giving a defense of the faith. And he says, we didn't make up the stories. We were eyewitnesses. And, and what was he an eyewitness of? He doesn't say, I was at Calvary when he died. I was at the tomb when he was raised. I was on the Mount of Olives when he ascended. No, it's, it's fascinating. He says, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I didn't make up stories when I told you about Jesus. I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I wonder why he said on that mountain. Why did he cite that event? In his thinking, this was a vitally important experience for him to be there on that sacred mountain and to see Jesus transfigured. Um, very, very important event as Peter uh, speaks about it in the epistle. I was there. I saw this happen. Why? Because here we see the real Jesus. Here you can see Peter, James, and John saying, Lord, now we know. We saw, we saw glimpses. We saw healings. We saw miracles. Uh, we saw you walking on water. We saw you stilling the storm. But now we know who you are. There's no doubt. We know who you are. You are the divine, majestic, glorious Son of God. We see it with our own eyes. I think when it comes to preaching and teaching, illustrations are very important because illustrations take the point and try to bring it home from probably a different angle. And Jesus often used illustrations that were mundane. The parables, the, the earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And, and I like to use illustrations, and I hope you're not disturbed. Now, the illustration I want to use is perhaps you're looking through a window and there you see this man come in with a fedora with glasses and a suit and a tie. And you're peeking, you're spying on him. And all of a sudden, he takes off the hat, the glasses, the suit, the tie. And he's Superman. Huh? Hey, I always thought you were Clark Kent, the mild-mannered reporter. Now I know who you are. I've seen it with my own eyes. I know who you are. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples looked at Jesus and said, I know who you are. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind regarding who this person is. You are King of kings, Lord of lords, God, God of God, mighty God of mighty God. You are the majestic, glorious, almighty eternal Son of God has manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
wonderful event. But if we look at the event of the transfiguration in anticipation of Lent, in anticipation of Good Friday, wow, it creates a real problem. I, I can't imagine Peter, James, and John having been on a Mount of Transfiguration, then seeing Jesus arrested, beaten, nailed to the cross, and seeing him die. Wouldn't you have to ask, how is that possible? We saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and now we see him beaten and mocked and bloodied, nailed to a cross. How could this be? How can you have this one picture and now this other picture? How is it possible? How is it possible that he who stood conversing with Moses and Elijah is slapped in the face for allegedly insulting some insignificant high priest? How is it possible that the glowing raiment on the Mount of Transfiguration turns into a bloody purple robe and a crown of thorns? How is it possible that he who received exaltation on the Mount of Transfiguration is humiliated, is mocked, is spit upon, is beaten, is tortured? How is that possible? How can we comprehend the voice of the Father declaring on the Mount of Transfiguration, you are my beloved Son, I'm pleased with you, I love you, and then to hear Jesus shouting from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How can you comprehend these two things? How is it possible that he who stood before Moses and Elijah, flanked by Moses and Elijah, would be nailed to a cross, flanked by two common criminals. How is it possible that the glory of the transfiguration could turn into the doom and darkness of the crucifixion? How is it possible that this can become that? that this could become that. How is it possible that you could put those two things together? That's why, as I told you in the beginning, the significance of the transfiguration is vital in the light of the crucifixion. Put these two in juxtaposition. And then you ask the question, how is it possible that this could happen? Well, a lot has been written about why it happened. A lot of theories have been put forth about why it happened. Hugh Schofield, a British theologian, wrote a book well, 50 years ago called The Passover Plot. Ridiculous book. And he sets down all the dynamics that took place for this whole thing of the crucifixion of Jesus to take place, to occur. And then, of course, you have people say, well, the Jews did it. The Jews did it. What do you mean the Jews did it? How were the Jews able to take the glorified, transfigured Christ and turn him into a common criminal dying on a cross? Well, the Romans did it. Yeah, the Romans did it. Yeah, right. They had a great army, but are they going to combat a myriad of angels? Who did it? I can't picture Caiaphas and Pilate following Peter, James, and John up that mount of transfiguration. And they're beholding the glory of the Christ, the eternal Son of God, seeing Moses and Elijah on either side, hearing the voice from heaven, and then saying, hey, let's crucify him. I can't picture that. I can't picture the soldiers who arrested him in the garden attempting to arrest him on Mount Tabor. Tabor, it wouldn't work. What caused this to occur? What happened here? Let me go back to my mundane illustration, okay? Let's say Hollywood came out with a movie 
about Superman. And in the movie, Clark Kent is arrested, put on trial, found guilty, and is executed. Would you ask the question, who did it? You did it. Would you say, was it the jury? Was it the judge? Was it the mob? Was it the police? Was it the executioner? You wouldn't ask those questions. The question you would ask was, where was Superman in all this? Where, where was he? We know what he did. How could this possibly happen? And the same way when we talk about Jesus and we see him on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have to ask the question, how could this possibly happen? What horrible thing had to be added into the mix for the glorified, transfigured Christ to become the crucified Christ? Something incredibly drastic had to take place for the Son of God to submit himself. And that's what he did. He submitted himself willingly to this humiliation. And what incredibly drastic thing had to happen? The prophet Isaiah makes it clear. When he says, God laid on him the iniquity of us all. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of the guilt and shame and all of the sins of this world were put upon Jesus and he submitted himself unto death, even death on a cross, doing so in order that the sins of the world would be forgiven. This is a global event. This is an event with cosmic consequences involving the entire world of sinners, past, present, and future. And it was only that which could have possibly made the change from the Christ on the Mount of the Transfiguration to the Christ on the Mount of the Crucifixion. Only the addition of the sins of the world. I'll give you an equation. The transfigured, majestic, glorified Christ plus the sins of the entire world equals the crucified Christ. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul writes, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He also writes, he who knew no sin became sin for us. John wrote in the second chapter of his first epistle, the second verse, he is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world or for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. This was a cosmic event. The sins of the whole world, past, present, future. And we and God added our little group to the mix. You see, sometimes... When it comes to the issue of sin and forgiveness, we, maybe we become a little self-important. As if, you know, it's all about me. Jesus died for me. And of course he did. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for the forgiveness of your sins. But it's like taking a bottle of water and dumping it into the ocean. Your contribution. It certainly is going to mix with the rest of the water, but it sure isn't going to cause a tidal wave. Yes, your sins were contributed to the mix. But he died for the sins of the whole world. I like to think of it. I was thinking about this. I like to think in this way. Yeah, Jesus died for me. Or maybe I could say Jesus died to forgive the sins of the whole world. And I'm a part of this world. And I'm a part of this world, this world for whom Jesus died. God so loved the world. What an act of love. 
that God would take the sins. He loved the world to such a degree that he took the sins of the whole world and put them upon Jesus so that this glorified, majestic, almighty, all-powerful Son of God submitted himself to the horror of the torture and the beating and the mockery and the death of the cross. That's the only way you could understand how the affirming voice of the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration, you're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you, could turn into the cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? The addition of the sins of the whole world laid upon him, and you added your share. Sometimes I have little patience with people who question whether their sins are forgiven. I wonder, are my sins forgiven? You know, as if you're such a real big, horrible sinner. Could God forgive my sins? What, you're not a part of the world? What, are you an alien from somewhere else? Jesus died for the sins of the world, and you're a part of the world. You're part of this planet where this grace was extended. So how can you say, unless, of course, you want to say, I'm not from here, how can you possibly remotely suggest that you are not included in this incredible forgiveness of sins that was brought to the entire world? It's only that bundle of sin and shame that was placed upon Jesus could turn the majestic, transfigured Christ into the humiliated, crucified Christ. And you contributed your share, and you're a part of this world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, whosoever. Years ago when I was pastor in New York City, I had somebody make up a banner The banner read, I am a whosoever. I am a whosoever. That whosoever believes in him will not perish. So he who was exalted was humiliated at the cross. I love the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And then he says this, Therefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given to him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As I told you in the beginning, you cannot understand the significance of the cross until you understand the significance of the transfiguration. Those two are put together the exaltation, the humiliation, the sins of the world placed upon the almighty Son of God, and you're a part of this world, therefore your sins are forgiven.